Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to DeBakey CV Live, coming to you from deep in the heart of Texas, Texas Medical Center and Houston Methodist Hospital. Uh, we have an interesting talk this afternoon. For many of you, this will be a little break from, uh, f from what's going on today. This is election day, uh, but maybe it's good to get away from the TV for an hour and do a little education. It'll uh, free your mind. Um, what you'll see on the screen is uh, a talk that I gave on Saturday at the stopafib.org meeting, treatment of atrial fibrillation, and there are three things that I've learned from patients over the last 16 years that they would like to achieve when they have atrial fibrillation. Stop blood thinners, eliminate strokes, and get in rhythm. And for a lot of patients, it's in that order. For many patients, it's more important to stop the blood thinners than to get in rhythm. And of course, eliminating strokes is always uh, important. Um, I'd like to show you what can be achieved if you can get back in rhythm and, and you get off blood thinners. And uh, we'll run that right now. This is Ross Rabluski. Ross is a skydiver. If you have AFib and you're taking blood thinners, it's not the ideal place to be. He put this on his arm, and this was unsolicited. Ross sent this to me. AFib grounded me. WolfMiniMaze.com got me back in the air. So Ross did have the mini maze a few years ago. And he was able to get back to the thing he loves, which is the skydive. And this is him after the mini maze. Way up in the air. And uh, away he goes. Now, I have a disclaimer. If you've never been skydiving and you have a mini maze, it doesn't mean you'll be able to do what Ross just did there. Uh, but if you were skydiving before, then there's a good chance you'll get up in the air. There's a site called wolfminimaze.com, and that was started by a skydiver. He was a skydiving photographer, and uh, about a year after his mini maze, he did a, a short thing for a local TV station where he got back up in the air. So he's the guy that holds the camera that I guess someone held for uh, to take Ross's skydive uh, video. And that was how he learned his, earned his living. So he was able to get back up in the air and take skydiving uh, photographs and videos. And he came to me at Christmas and he said, Doc, I got a present for you. And I said, what's that, George? And he goes, uh, you need a website. And I said, well, he said, nobody knows what you're doing. This was about 15 years ago. And I said, well, George, uh, just to know that you're an AFib is enough present for me for this Christmas. He goes, no, Doc, I already did it. I already started the website. And he's the one that named it Wolf Mini Maze, and it's wolfminimaze.com. It's gone through several iterations since George the Skydiver started it. Uh, but he did a good thing, and it helps a lot of people. And you can get more information at wolfminimaze.com on AFib treatments. Got testimonials. It e even has a video of how the procedure is done. Now, during this hour, if you'd like to ask a question, you may do so. If you have a, a smartphone, you go to your smartphone, you go to Messages, and there's a little button that says New Message. You hit that New Message, and then you type in 2, it's 37607. So you type in 37607, and then in the box, the text box, you put the word DeBakey for DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Just put in DeBakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, and then you can pose a question on your smartphone 
during this hour, and we will try to get to it. If you don't, if you'd like to be on, use your computer, you can uh, go to the site called pollev.com. That's P-O-L-L, just like a presidential poll. But this would be pollev.com. And again, you enter Debakey, and then you can uh, send an email. But if you have a smartphone, you pick it up, you go to Messages, you go to New Message, it's a little, little icon in the top, put in 37607, and then in the text box, put Debakey, and you can ask a question. Okay, now, Ross uh, Rabluski uh, lives in California, and he, at one time he owned a, a skydiving business, and I imagine if you run that kind of business, you have to be awfully careful, kind of like the carpenter who measures three times and cuts once. There's little room for error when you run a skydiving school. Ross did that, so he's very particular, very careful, does his homework. When he developed atrial fibrillation, he did the same. He attended the Stop AFib uh, conference in Dallas at the time. It was virtual this year, last Saturday. And then uh, he decided what he wanted to do. He had a procedure. And he sent me, I guess maybe a year after that, this matrix of how one might decide what to do about your AFib. Because there are many options. And it's a little confusing. As a physician, sometimes we don't think about this much. But as a patient, you think about it all the time. You're bombarded with these different options. And you really don't know which way to go. So with that introduction, and again, if you'd like to join by text, you can, or send us an email to pollev.com. Let's, let's, uh, uh, let's bring Ross in with us, and uh, virtually, and we'll let him go through his thought process. Ross also can screen share and show us the matrix that he worked on as he went through to decide what he should do for AFib. So Ross, uh, welcome to DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center, to uh, DeBakey CV Live, and thanks for joining us, and please uh, impart your thought processes to people that may be going through the same thing that you went through, what, three years ago, something like that? Uh, yes, actually, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, looking forward to trying to help uh, other patients if I can. Um, back in 2015 is when I started uh, experiencing um, paroxysmal uh, AFib. So that, that, was, that was a time frame right there. And it, was, it didn't, wasn't bother me all that much, but it really got my attention uh, any time that I did have a uh, episode. And uh, so I started actually uh, documenting the episodes uh, where you, know, you get that flutter in your heart and uh, you know the heart rate is high, and you're being deprived of oxygen, so your your mind your your mind is not thinking real straight, and it really gets your attention, obviously. So uh, I would document a little bit uh, what the duration was, the days it would occur, and there were far and few between, only a few times a year. And and so I thought, okay, I can kind of get past this. I thought I was doing it by exercise or by uh, uh, strenuous. Uh, activities such as lifting heavy objects and so forth. But uh, later in 2015, I started noticing that the uh, episodes were lasting longer. They were occurring more often, and uh, it really became pretty debilitating at that point. So in early six, 2016, um, I was in what I, I did not know it at the time, but I, I, I had actually got to the point where I was in persistent atheism where it was happening all the time. And that's when I went to see the doctor. And um, that's, that's where the journey, journey to find a remedy was. Well, um, keep, uh, that's a good story. Uh, keep going. Okay. Well, um, my, my first experience uh, was I had a little time off one day. So this had been, it was bothering me pretty bad. So I went to the doctor and they got all very excited. It was just a general practitioner at the urgent care. They immediately set me up with a cardiologist in the afternoon. And uh, the cardiologist was, was concerned and uh, said that uh, they need to get me on a blood thinner. You know, kind of explained that real quick, like try to avoid strokes. 
And um, they also put me on uh, beta blocker and set me up uh, with a uh, appointment with an EP. I followed up with the EP. The EP put me on a uh, seek uh, monitor on my chest for 30 days to uh, evaluate, you know, what the arrhythmia problem was. And uh, that, during this time, obviously, I'm being advised that I have a atrial fibrillation, which is kind of my first introduction to it. Uh, after the 30 days, the uh, EP uh, and I met with a follow-up, and he says, you have three choices. You can do nothing if you want to do that, uh, or you could go on, you know, stay on these medications and try to control it that way, or you might consider a, an ablation procedure of some sort. And at that time, uh, he was working uh, with um, uh, a uh, study called the AMAZE. Uh, trial. And so um, I went ahead and stayed on medications for a short period of time and uh, told him I'd go ahead and volunteer for this particular procedure. Later on, I, I didn't end up qualifying for the trial study. So I was kind of um, stuck in this situation for a while looking for uh, remedies. Came across uh, stopafib.com, Melanie's um, website, and saw that they had a a convention or co conference coming up in Dallas, and I attended that. And just like you said, uh, um, any uh, participant that uh, has attended will tell you that it's a lot of great information, but it's a lot of information. <laughs> and so with my um, research that I'd done and reading, you know, talking to doctors at that point, and actually attended a couple other conferences in the local area about AFib, but uh, after that conference, with all that information, I left. Uh, I felt like I needed to get it organized in some way and relook at those options that uh, were given to me. Because at that conference, this is where I learned about the fourth option that my cardiologist and EP did not tell me about. And that is, of course, the surgical procedures, of, uh, primarily the Wolf Mini Maze procedure. And um, so as I left, uh, there were I met some. I met a lot of interesting people, obviously, but some really good folks, uh, a call out, Michaela, Ellen, uh, Margaret. Uh, uh, they, they were a group of ladies who also were uh, there to learn more about the procedure. And um, they had a friend named Sandy who was there earlier too. Michaela was a very strong, uh, uh, strong person. She, uh, kind of led the charge and said, I'm not going to stay on medications and I'm not going to do these uh, half half attempts, you know, like uh, uh, catheter ablation stuff. I want to remedy this. I want to get on with my life. And so that was quite an influence to me, but I still wanted to evaluate all the options uh, being in persistence. So that's going to be an important part of this, this uh, matrix, if you will. Where you are in this progression, um, relates a little bit to which option you may want to consider. So yeah, we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, Ross, so, uh, if you don't mind me interrupting just for a second. Sure. At this point, were you still able to skydive? Because now you're on a blood thinner and you have continuous AFib. Oh, busted. <laughs> uh, okay, so rewind to just before the conference at the end of August. Uh, despite the fact that common sense would tell you not to do this. Yes, being on blood thinners, I was out skydiving. Keep in mind, I've been, I have over 3,600 jumps and did run a parachute center. And um, so I felt very confident, overconfident, a typical guy thing, I guess. And so uh, I'm on these medications that are trying to slow my heart down, you know, my thought processes um, and the blood thinners. And I went out skydiving. I was on a high-performance parachute. And didn't make, I didn't do some tuning that I should have done. And uh, kind of drilled myself uh, into the ground on a landing and uh, ended up in the hospital. So uh, with that, when I, when I left, uh, this is an, actually is an important point. They put me on uh, digoxin and diltiazan and uh, back onto the blood thinners, obviously, after the bleeding stopped. And um, that, that, uh, that, that made my thinking even you know, tougher. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. at that point, yeah, that well, wasn't such a good 
good idea, obviously. So I stayed away from it after that and uh, progressed to trying to get a remedy, get a treatment. Um, uh, I want to remind everyone who's listening, if you have a smartphone, uh, you go turn on your smartphone and you go to messages, hit the message, and what will come up, you can hit the icon that says new message, and it says two, and you type in 37607, 37607, I'll do it right now, 37607, and you've joined DeBakey CV Education, and then you can go to the text message, and you type in DeBakey, and then you can send us a text. Here is a text. Uh, this is kind of a difficult question to answer, but I'll take it. Are there doctors in the Seattle area who you recommend that have expertise for forming the wolf mini maze? Well, expertise for forming the wolf mini maze is the tricky part. Um, I do this every week. I do anywhere from two to four of these a week, or one to five a week. Um, and if someone does one or two a year, I don't consider that maybe to be expertise, but they may. There are many centers around the country where they say they do the wolf mini maze, but when you pin them down, they don't do very many at all. So I think a center needs to do, gosh, at least, at least one or two a week to have a lot of experience doing that. I don't know anybody in Seattle that fits that bill. There are very few people in the United States to fit that bill. And also, people get confused with the Wolf Mini Maze versus the Convergent Procedure. The Convergent Procedure is not a mini maze. It's where the surgeon burns the back of the heart through a sub xiphoid up underneath the breastbone, surgical approach. And then about eight weeks later, a catheter ablation is performed for the rest of the procedure. I think it has a lot of shortcomings. The Convergent Procedure, depends on catheter ablation to make all the line or most of the lines. And from my experience, catheter ablation does not get a good line all the way through the heart. And that's one of the reasons many people have had two, three, four. I've even taken care of patients with a mini maze who've had six prior ablations. Secondly, with the convergent procedure, the left atrial appendage is not addressed. This is where the clots form in AFib the clot can break loose and of course can go to the brain and cause a stroke. Then the AFib becomes not just a heart disease, but it's a brain disease too. So I think it's very important to address the left atrial appendage. The watchman does not electrically isolate the appendage. Many of you may have heard about the watchman just watching TV, but the watchman doesn't electrically isolate the appendage. So you still have the possibility of the appendage participating in the AFib circuit. In addition, the watchman generally doesn't close the appendage all the way, and there's still a possibility, significant possibility of strokes with a watchman. There isn't with the wolf mini maze. So uh, back to the, the basic part of the question. Um, I don't know anybody in Seattle that has what I would call a, a, the expertise that you might be interested in uh, this is a procedure that I think is simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. It's working on the beating, beating heart through a scope without the surgeon putting their hands inside the body. So uh, for me, it comes second nature, uh, but for a lot of surgeons, they're not very comfortable working on the beating heart. There's another procedure which was presented on Saturday, and that's the Cox Maze 4 done minimally invasive, but that's on the heart-lung machine Tubes are put in the groin to go on the heart-lung machine. The heart is arrested, and then the, uh, the left atrium is opened and visualized directly. And so when you get to that complicated of a procedure, you also can add the possibility of complications. So um, if you look at the results of the minimally invasive Cox Maze 4 versus the Mini Maze, they overlap significantly depending on which study you look look at. So I don't see, think there's a big enough advantage to do that much more of an invasive procedure. So again, if you have more questions, um, send them to us. Uh, get on your uh, smartphone. Uh, go to new message. 
put in 37607 and then text uh, DeBakey. Now let's get back to uh, Ross's story. So Ross, just to get bring everybody back to where you were, you've gotten to the point where you've been evaluated by an EP. They gave you three choices. They didn't give you the surgical option. You found out about that at uh, Melanie Truehill's meeting, stopafib.org. And then you took that information back, and I think that's about where we, where we stopped. So please go yes. ahead. Okay, so um, what I hear from a lot of the other patients at the conference is that, that, that this really sounds, the, the wolf and he may, sounds um, very appealing to them, very logical. It, it seems to hit all the, um, all the concerns people have that you've just articulated. Uh, however, there, everybody continues to consider all the other possibilities good because uh, you know, it's a little scary to think about going to surgery. Mm -hmm. So they are looking at uh, catheter ablation or maybe just staying on medication. And uh, the challenge with, uh, there were challenges with that, but there was too much information for me to, you know, it just kept, I kept swimming in all this information, just pretty much like the rest of the participants most of the participants that I talked to at the conference. So that's the reason why I came up with this, uh, this matrix, which is basically just breaking those four uh, options down. And it, there could be five or six, uh, I guess, if you think about it. I did not uh, put down the, um, the last uh, option that you were just talking about that was presented by one of the other uh, surgeons uh, this weekend. Mm -hmm. I just stopped at the, the, the uh, Wolf Mini Man. So those three options, again, were to do nothing. And uh, we could maybe pull that up and I can kind of show yeah. how the... Yeah, go ahead and know. screen share with our audience and okay. uh, go through some of the things that you thought were important to consider. Okay. Okay, that looks right. good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll just kind of stream down this to start off with, see that it moves. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is Ross's. Can you see? I guess hopefully you can see the pointer. Yep. Uh, I, I try to emphasize that this is my personal AFib treatment decision matrix. The reason is I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. Uh, I try to put these in layman terms. And basically it boils down to here's option one. Um, I'll highlight it here for you. Op option ones over in this area. And this is the pros to it, no medication. I, I won't go through all these, but just to kind of give you an, ex an idea how it works. Uh, no medications, no surgical risk, ongoing research may discover new treatments. Mm -hmm. But what are the cons? You know, without treatment, one in three people living uh, over here on the other side, living with AFib will have a stroke in their lifetime. AFib progression, paroxysmal to persistent, um, it's very progressive disease, as I understand, and I had a little bit of mm -hmm. statistics there on that, mm -hmm. that uh, persistent AFib can lead to substrate modification, uh, thickening, stiffening of the heart walls and things like that. So what I did is I tried to list, um, I took the notes that I actually rece received or wrote down at the conference, and, and I put them into, you know, basically a logic matrix to try to, try to encapsulate what I'd learned. So obviously I didn't want to go through this uh, particular procedure. So uh, I looked at a second option, which was the cardio versions, and, or excuse me, the medications, you know, to, to start on the medications. Now, obviously at, at the point I had left off a little while ago, I was already on medications, but I wanted to go a step further because I obviously cannot be doing the medications like blood thinners and things that kind of make your foggy mind and skydive or fly airplanes, ride motorcycles, you know, what have you. So uh, in this, just as an example, um, here in this particular area, see if I can bring up a highlighter here, yeah. Uh, there was no surgical, the pros to it, no surgical risk. Uh, you can be cardioverted, chemical or electric, you know, and that may get you electrically, uh, may get you back in normal sinus rhythm. Um, the anticoagulants uh, help reduce the chance of a, a stroke. Um, you know, so it slows the progression of AFib to some extent. 
But there are quite a few cons, as you can see on this side. Mm -hmm. Be on uh, medications for for me was equal to being on life support because it <laughs> it didn't allow me to enjoy my life to you know do the things that I wanted to do. So this this was just not just not an option for me. And, and so these cons list all the different things that I learned at the conference and through research. There was actually, like I said, a couple of local um, uh, conferences that I went to too, and, and it was pretty much the same at each one of the uh, conferences Ross, that I went to. Ross. And so I tried. Yes. Um, since you mentioned quality of life, I'd like to take one of our questions that's come up. And again, sure. uh, for everyone, you can go to your smartphone, hit messages. Uh, put 37607 in a new message, and then in the text box, put DeBakey and you'll join the conference. Um, here's a question. It says, Ross, have you noticed any improvement in quality of life after the procedure? Oh, absolutely. That's, uh, I'm back to where I was before um, I started having these, uh, before I had AFib. Okay. I haven't experienced it in three and a half years. So my quality of life is I'm I'm back up I'm pegged out, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm pumped up. Go go skydive, fly. Now I don't skydive right now as much as uh, I'd like to. I maintain proficiency, uh, but obviously with COVID uh, being in a you know a small aircraft, well, they're not real small, but it's like 18 other people breathing and uh, <laughs> yeah. pushing out. You know, <laughs> breathing uh, breathing pretty virus. hard and pretty fast, probably. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So um, I kind of had to back off that, but I'm still riding motorcycle, flying, things like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the things I used to be concerned about a lot was swimming. I, I really felt like I'd need to wear a life preserver unit uh, that I could not ever fall overboard or get caught out in water where I needed to tread because any activity that, where I exerted myself, and, and other patients understand this too, uh, causes you to be short of breath and uh, feel like you're suffocating to mm -hmm, some extent. Mm -hmm. So. It, it uh, you know, it's just not a good place to be. So, my, yes, my quality of life would not be good in that case or even on meds. I've, uh, I've, I learned something. It took me many years to figure this out, but people would have the mini maze. They'd come back a few months later and say, I feel better than I have in 10 years. And I yeah. go, well, that's great. You're back in rhythm, but you feel that much better? And I realized over time it's not just getting back in rhythm. It's also getting off medications. Yes. So I think half of it is, I mean, some of these medications make you so tired by noontime, you're on the couch, you're pooped out. So one yes. of the other advantages of, of what we do is we're, of course, we're looking at the nerves on the outside of the heart with the Wolf Mini Maze, which you can't do with a catheter ablation. And it increases the chances that you're going to be in rhythm and off all medications. So getting off medications, I think, is half the battle. The other half is getting back in rhythm, but they go together. Yes. So uh, I'm sorry. And can I put in one more question here just so we keep up with the questions? Oh, please. Um, this, <laughs> says, this is from, a, uh, from the, uh, what was this, from a smartphone? How long does it take before you know a patient qualifies for the procedure? Well, I'll take that one, Ross. Um, and by the way, uh, people ask about uh, here in, in Houston, every year I do patients from about half the United States. This past week, one patient was from California, one patient was from uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, we do patients from usually about half the states in the country every year. I fly to Houston, stay here for about 10 days, have their procedure, go back home, and so far, knock on wood, Everybody that we've done here at, uh, in Houston at, De, at DeBakey Heart and Vascular has flown back home. So uh, we, haven't, we have a, a, good, a good track record. Let's put, this, put it that way. But what we do is we get, if you call us, you, we ask for permission to look at your medical records. A lot of times we can pull it up on Epic. If not, we have people at the front office that can get your medical records. You don't have to go find them at the hospital. We do that for you. I review them. There's no charge for that. And then we set up a, a teleconference type meeting. It's a Zoom meeting with Epic and we do telemedicine and I interact with you. That way 
people who decide to come here only have to come here one time. They come here, I see them, we do the procedure the next day because I've already reviewed all the tests and procedures that have been done. And that's worked well for many, many years. In fact, I think it's better than just showing up in someone's uh, office. So you can go to wolfminimaze.com. You can say, I'd like to be evaluated, send it to us, and we can help you work on it. And if I don't think we can help you, I tell you, most of the time, if I look at your information, look at your history, I can either say, yes, we can help you with the mini maze, and you have other options, or no, I can't help you. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Question is, how many procedures have you done? Uh, over 2,000 mini maze procedures. I developed the procedure. The first one I did was in 2003. Our first manuscript was uh, in 2005. That was the re first report in the world on the mini maze procedure. It wasn't called mini maze at that time, but that's the, that's the first paper, and you can find that paper on the Wolf Mini Maze site. Since that paper, other papers have been written about the mini maze, and that paper has been referenced, I think, over 600 times uh, by other authors. Um, so uh, it's pretty easy to get evaluated, and I'd, if I don't think I can help you, I tell you. But if you've had prior ablations, it's all right. If you've had a stroke, it's okay. One of the patients from last week presented with a stroke. They didn't know they had AFib. If you uh, have a pacemaker, it's okay. Uh, so uh, many patients do qualify the, for the procedure. Hello, Mr. Wolf. Oh, now I'm Mr. Wolf. I've been demoted. I attended the conference last week. I was taken off amiodarone for toxicity complications. I'm in persistent AFib for approximately one, which I mean, I guess is one year. That's very typical. And the way I look at it is what I call my rule of fives. If you've been continuously out of rhythm, not in and out, but continuously for over five years, and your left atrium is over 5.5 centimeters, then the chances of a successful ablation start going down a little bit. But they're still good. I mean, we run over 92% AFib free at six, six years with uh, paroxysmal AFib. Uh, does a patient have, does a patient, okay, this is, how about a patient who has persistent AFib? That means you're continuously out of, out of rhythm. If you've been out of rhythm, if you've had to have a cardioversion or you're out of rhythm continuously for over seven days in a row, that's called persistent AFib. And mild to moderate regurgitation, so I think that means mild regurgitation of the mitral valve. Are you still a good candidate for the mini maze procedure? Generally, yes, because I look at the echo. If the echo was done when the heart was out of rhythm, that means you're probably going to get more regurgitation from that mitral valve. You get back in rhythm, the amount of regurgitation, which is leakage of the valve, usually decreases. So if, the, if you had mild to moderate regurgitation and you're out of rhythm, that usually improves if you just get back in rhythm. Here's another one. Uh, I believe my AFib is triggered by the vagus nerve. My understanding is ablation does not stop vagus nerve triggers of AFib, does the mini maze. Great question. The answer is absolutely. I mean, that's what we do. And I'll show you. I'm going to interrupt Ross for just a little bit more to answer this, and we'll get back to the. No, oh, this is a good, good question. Yeah. So we go to, we're going to go to, uh, I'm going to screen share on my screen and show you something that explains it all. Uh, if you don't mind, gentlemen, if, if you could go to screen share on my, my uh, laptop. And uh, we're talking about vagal AFib. And that is what the mini maze focuses on. The nerves are on the outside of the heart and they're around the pulmonary veins. So I figured out a way working with some researchers in Oklahoma to Find out where these vagal nerve fibers are on the outside of the heart. You can see on this slide where we've mapped them. There's, we published a paper, which is to the right here, on mapping and isolation of the ganglionic plexi. Well, ganglionic plexi come from the vagus nerve. This is the same nerve that goes to your stomach. Some people say, I get kind of upset stomach. I know it's coming on, and I go out of rhythm. It's the same nerve. It's the vagal nerve. So these, the vagus gives off little branches. Guess where they are? Right around the pulmonary veins. 
So we figured out where those are, we ablate those, and then we test them again. And if we test them again and now we don't get any response from these little nerve fibers, we know we've stopped the autonomic nervous innervation of the heart. And you can't do that from inside the heart because the nerves are on the outside of the heart. So catheter ablation, you are correct, cannot get to these areas, but the mini maze can. And if you were to map it out on the back of the heart, you look at the left atrium, you look at the superior pulmonary vein on the left, inferior pulmonary vein on the left, superior and inferior pulmonary vein on the right, you can see these nerves are right around the pulmonary veins, but they're on the outside of the heart. Easy for us to get to with the Wolf Mini Maze. We do it every day. It's a piece of cake. You can't get to them on the inside with a catheter ablation. I believe that the goal of AFib treatment is not to destroy heart tissue. Catheter ablation destroys a lot of heart tissue. Once it's gone, it doesn't come back. With the mini maze, we don't destroy heart tissue. We make a line around the veins like a pencil, but we do get these ganglionic plexi. So that's a great question and uh, very important. Next question is for Ross. Uh, uh, so we can go back from my slide, I guess, to uh, Ross. So the question for you, Ross, is, is Ross still on anticoagulants? Actually, you could answer that. <laughs> well, you go ahead and no, answer it. Okay. So uh, I believe he took me off just before the operation. I've never been back on them since. Yeah, and that's pretty typical. Because we close the appendage completely, not halfway like the, like the watchman, we close the appendage completely. Unless you have some other reason to be on anticoagulants, we stop them before the surgery and don't restart them after. So again, if you, these are all excellent questions. If anybody else has a question, you go on your smartphone, go to messages, go to new message, and at the top put in 37607, and then in the text box put DeBakey, and you'll be uh, in with us and you can ask questions. So Ross, after a lengthy, uh, uh, interruption there. I'd like you to finish your uh, matrix. Okay, uh, so uh, we're on the screen there. A uh, couple points that I wanted to emphasize is that these um, statements that I have here, each one of these bullets represents um, either information that was given off a slide or by the doctors at the conference. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm not a doctor or a scientist. So I try to compress the information that I received, and there was just a lot of it, but compress it down to just what was absolutely important to think about as far as a con with um, cardioversion as an example and medications. Same way with Moving down to option three uh, with the pulmonary vein isolation, catheter ablation procedures. What were the success rates? What are, what are the benefits of that? Um, also, this box here is broken down in a, into two parts. There's, um, let, me, let me get a pointer here real quick. Line. There's kind of the top portion of it here is just going in for a catheter ablation. I, obviously, you hear that there's uh, an ability to address the left atrial appendage. But a point here, when you go over to the other side, I'll do this real quick, is now I've got two separate operations. And uh, that, this is just one consideration in the con. But there are other uh, considerations in the con, too, as well. So, you know, I wanted to be able to get something I can just kind of read quickly and, and get through and try to, try to come up with a, you know, a decision on it. Let me take this off for a second. And then let me make a point. If, and, and get well, let me just finish this off. The, the fourth option that I did adopt was a surgical ablation uh, that you see down at the, down at the bottom, uh, which was number four. And I'll highlight it real quick like here, which was the Wolf Mini Maze procedure and the pros and cons. So what I, what, what, you, what, I've, what I found interesting when I got finished with this is let me go back to the top. 
I look at uh, option one, very few pros, a box full of cons. Uh, option two, cardioversion medication, a few more pros, still a lot of cons. Uh, catheter ablation, far more um, benefits again, but an awful lot of cons. Then I got down to the, the Wolf Mini Maze procedure, far more um, an all-inclusive, comprehensive treatment plan to address all the issues, you know, all the concerns that I had. And the cons were just so very limited, very, very small. Um, obviously, you're going to have, as I put down here, pre-operation anxiety. There are costs in, in logistics, you know, you have to take into consideration. I'm sure you can address that. Um, there, there, there could still be, you know, you have to know up front, small complications, and you've already addressed that. And then there's going to be a little bit of discomfort uh, after the procedure. But then I get my life back. I get back into full rhythm, and I can participate in the sports that I want and have, a, have you know, continue on with that great quality of life that I had before. So that that's uh, in a snapshot. I was able to collect a lot of information about each one of these uh, procedures and, um, you know, assess where I was with persistent AFib, what, what I felt like I needed to do to uh, come up with, a, you know, to decide on a, on a treatment plan. So people don't need to use this. They can use any, any sort of thing, but you got to get organized. You, you have to be able to make a decision. And that's, that's the challenge is trying to encapsulate so much information, and that's the reason why I came up with this, because I, I felt like I needed to make a, a decision. Medications, I, like I said, it's like life support. I just think has long-term complications. I don't want to keep going back in for um, catheter ablations. I want kind of a, like Mickey said, a one and done. Get in there, get out. If there's touch-ups necessary in the future, so be it. But uh, I've had great success with this, and I, I hope that uh, other patients take advantage. And I always, and for <laughs> Dr. Wall, um, kind of a, I don't know if it's a joke or not, but something some of us talk about on, on the side, but it's very important. You have a shelf life. You're going to want to retire to the, to the farm and mm -hmm. to the ranch there, and, and you're going to want to carry on with your life and, and have fun. And uh, so you won't be doing this. And like you said earlier, there's few people around that, that uh, do this procedure like you do. You're, you know, the uh, innovator of this procedure as well as uh, the tools that are being used. And uh, people should try to take advantage of it, of it if this is their uh, treatment of choice, if you will. Well, th well thank you very much, uh, Ross. And uh, I'll add that we also use the link device, which is a implantable uh, chip, if you will, uh, implantable loop. Oh, you got one right there? Yeah, but there you go. And, and that allows us to follow people like Ross continuously. So it's very objective. We know if our patients are having any AFib. And interestingly, most people that do catheter ablation don't put in a link. And I think sometimes they just don't want to know because the results aren't that great. And there's still a lot of AFib. I'd like to go to uh, another question, if I might. And uh, again, if you have a question, you go on your smartphone, you go to messages, there's a little icon, hit new message, and at the top, you go 37607, and then down in the text box, you put to Bakey, and you'll join us, and you can just type in your question and text it to us. It's very easy to do. Okay, here's the question. Uh, uh, what function does the LAA serve, which is the left atrial appendage? What limitation do you have after removal or closing the left atrial appendage? If we can go back to my screen share on my computer, while I talk, I'll show you exactly what Ross had done. I don't know if this was his particular case, but uh, are we okay to go ahead? So this is the approach. Again, we don't put our hands inside the chest. We use long instruments. That's the left atrial appendage. This is the atriclip. The first uh, thousand cases I did with a stapler, but then when this was available, this is what I use now. It's a little bit easier, a little bit faster than the stapler. 
and you can see we close the entire left atrial appendage. It's sort of a real fancy hair clip that we put on the base of the appendage. And once that's on, the appendage is completely excluded. Now, the left atrial appendage during embryology, that means before you're born, is part of the back of the heart, the left atrium. But as before you're born, it moves to the side and the veins grow in from the lungs. This is just how the heart develops in the embryo. So it's kind of a leftover. In fact, it's an appendix. It used to be called the appendix of the heart. The original name was the appendix of the heart. Every, every human has two, one on the right, and this one, of course, is the left, left atrial appendage, and you can do without one. The only thing that I've seen after it's out is, one, you have better blood pressure control, and that's been shown in a study. We have patients that are on three blood pressure pills. After the mini maze, we can eliminate all of them because after that appendage is closed, your blood pressure normalizes and you get back in rhythm. Closing the appendage eliminates electrically that area of the heart, and sometimes the AFib comes from the appendage. I've had many patients where as soon as we close the appendage, heart's back in rhythm. That's a good sign. Those patients almost never have any other AFib. Uh, secondly, we eliminate the source of the blood clots. If you take Eliquis or Xeralto, you decrease your risk of AFib stroke by 60%. If you have the appendage closed, like Ross did, you stop blood thinners and you decrease your risk of stroke by 97%. So it's much better and you don't have to take blood thinners the rest of your life. So as far as function, it has a little bit of hormonal function, but what we found is you close the appendage, the blood pressure normalizes, so it's all good. We haven't, I've closed over 2,000 of them. We don't have any adverse effects from closing it. Question. Uh, what's the 10-year follow-up success rate? I did a study, it's about seven years old now, and at uh, six years for paroxysmal, 92% success rate, for uh, persistent, 85%, and for long-standing persistent, 75%. So it holds up to any bigger procedure, like a Cox Maze 4, and much, much better than a convergent procedure. Next question. What percent need touch-ups? Well, a touch-up would be if after a year of the mini maze, or a year after the mini maze, you're still having AFib. You can do a touch-up procedure. We send maybe one or two people a year for a touch-up. It could be more than a touch-up, but it's very successful. In the last uh, paper that was published from another institution in Europe showed that 23 out of 25 people after a touch-up stayed in rhythm. So it's very effective. After the mini maze, the appendage is closed, the pulmonary veins are isolated. So if there's some other unusual spot, uh, we can focus on that. So it's very successful for a touch-up. Now this is a question that came up, I guess, on Saturday. Is the procedure FDA approved? No, most procedures are not FDA approved. It's the devices that are approved. The F and I designed the device that's used for the mini maze. It's the same one used for the Cox maze 4. Uh, you, what, what the FDA wants to know is what is the device. The way you use it is up to you. You can stand on your head as a surgeon and use it. They don't care. You can put it through a sternotomy and use the device. You can put it through little incisions on the side. The FDA doesn't care. You have to get the device FDA approved. You can get a procedure FDA approved, but most procedures are not FDA approved. There's no reason to do it. In the, in the case of the mini maze, it's covered by Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross, United. Most insurance companies cover this, and 95% of them cover it. There's no reason to get FDA approved. There was a reason to get the Cox Maze 4 FDA approved, and that is because the Cox Maze 4 almost all the time is performed when the surgeon's doing a mitral valve procedure or some other open heart procedure. There are very few Cox Maze 4s that have been done as a standalone procedure. Precious few. It's almost concomitant. So the surgeon was doing a mitral valve, and oh, they did the, the Cox Maze 4 at the same time. They weren't getting paid anything for the Cox Maze 4. It was an added on to the, to the mitral procedure. 
So there was a reason to get it FDA approved so they could bill it separately. We don't need to do that with the mini maze because we're just doing the AFib procedure. So in general, procedures are not FDA approved with exceptions. Where do patients stay in Houston? Uh, we are connected to a Marriott, so if you want to stay uh, at Methodist and not even have to go outside, you can stay at the Marriott that's connected to Houston Methodist. Uh, a half a block uh, down the street is a pretty new uh, intercontinental. I like that. It's very nice. Uh, patient, the, the physician from Indianapolis uh, last week uh, stayed at the um, Weston that's a half a block away. There are over 100,000 people that come to work at Texas Medical Center every day. This is the largest medical center in the world. There are probably 30 hotels right around the area, but some of them are either attached to the hospital or a block away. Ross, do you remember where you stayed? Uh, yeah, it was at your uh, Herman Memorial. Uh, oh, that's right. You stayed at the Weston. That was the Weston. Weston, yes. Yeah. So, yes. That was the Weston. So, um, and, and about 10 days total. I, I recommend patients stay 10 days if you're flying in because then I can see you in the office uh, about six to seven days before you go home. And if that's the time when I put the link in. It's subcutaneous. It's under local anesthesia. We do it in the office. Uh, it's a little local anesthesia. And it's a syringe. We shoot the device under the skin. That allows us to follow you wherever you are in the world for three to four years. You don't have to go to the ER. You don't have to go to the hospital or see a doctor. You can call me. I can tell you what your rhythm is on every day that ends in a Y. Right, Ross? Yes. How long do you stay in the hospital? The average stay is 2.5 days. Uh, some people go out on two days or three days. So the average is about 2.5. If there's a rhythm abnormality or the heart rate's very slow after surgery, which it can be for a few days, it may be a day or two longer. A fellow from uh, California last week had a low heart rate coming in of about 50. So he stayed a couple extra days until his heart rate got up to 50 again. How long after the procedure can you fly home? Well, I had a, uh, an attorney from Chicago, and she flew home about four days after a procedure, and then she drove herself from the, from the uh, airport back home and was back at work the next week. Uh, but I generally think you ought to take a couple of weeks off. Ross, I don't remember what your personal situation was, but didn't we do more than just mini maze? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, it was just the mini maze. Uh, my, my recovery, I, I mentioned this uh, a couple of days ago at the conference, was, um, you know, went in in the morning back in the, um, the hospital room, you know, by mid-morning, I think it was, late morning, something like that. Just uh, rested there in the hospital the rest of Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, Friday morning I was doing laps around the, the ward. And Friday <laughs> afternoon you released me. Saturday my brother flew in. We went down to the coast and ate some uh, seafood, and then he flew out the next day. And and I was ready to go. You know, it, it's uh, I had my airline, you know, pushed off a little ways to um, to account for coming back in having the sutures removed. Um. If someone is interested in the matrix that you worked on, is there a particular way they can get it from you, Ross? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe email would be the best. Yeah, email, uh, if, if you're okay with that. Yes, uh, that, that will work out best. But uh, it, it is a little bit complicated, I wish. Oh, your email. Yeah, you got an unusual one. Uh, yeah, but but go, ahead, it. go ahead and, and, and spell it out slowly, and, and we can emphasize that later, too. Okay. Um, Firehawk. Let's see if I can do some. Well, I, I won't do it. Uh, Firehawk, F-I-R-E-H-A-W-K, 2000, underscore, Four zero four at msn dot com. One more time. Okay. Firehawk 
F-I-R-E-H-A-W-K, 2000 underscore 404 at msn.com. Okay, thank you. A couple more sure. quick questions I'd like to get to, and you can chime in if any of them are appropriate. Can a patient come alone or need help on the way home, airport, wheelchair, et cetera? Uh, we do have patients come here alone, especially if you stay at the Marriott. You just, you're, you just walk down the hall and you're in the hospital. You don't have to even go outside. I don't remember. That's what I did. You didn't bring anybody with you, did you, Ross? No, I was, I was solo. Okay. Uh, does the link, uh, this is the little uh, subcutaneous monitor, have to be removed? It does not. When it runs out of battery, I think, Ross, yours is about out now, and you just left it in, right? Yes, that's, that's where so I'm at right now. You can just leave it in. Uh, what was the rest of that question? Uh, let me go back. There was a little bit more to that question. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we return to Houston? I've had people come back to put another one in. There's a, a judge here in uh, Harris County that we take care of, and her link ran out, and she gets a lot of peace of mind by it, knowing that it's still working. So we just left the old one in and put a, a new one in next to it. And again, just do it in the office, a 15-minute procedure. Uh, resting heart rates, 40s, would still be a candidate. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. How much time before normal activities? Well, I think that depends on uh, the, the bigger you are, I think the slower your recovery is. Ross is a pretty normal-sized guy, uh, not overweight. And uh, normal activities, it's eh, still, what, two, three weeks, wouldn't you say? I don't know. What was your experience, Ross? Um, I guess normal well, activities of, yeah. driving, well, that was right, driving was right away, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, when I flew back. Matter of fact, I had a rental car there and was getting kind of bored, you know, being around the motel room. So I was I was driving around Houston, going over to the shopping center across the street, and, you know, going around and stuff like that. So the recovery was very quick. Okay. Uh, how do you determine whether I'm a candidate? Again, all you have to do is go to wolfminimaze.com, W-O-L-F-M-I-N-I-M-A-Z-E, uh, fill out the form or, or call the number that's there. Uh, you can call, um, uh, we got several numbers. There's one on the website which I don't have memorized, but the other number that you can call is, I do have it here. Um, this is uh, a number of the front office. It's uh, 713 Four four one six five one seven seven one three four four one six five one seven, or the very fr uh, front front office is same number ending in uh, fifty two hundred uh, seven one three four four one uh, fifty two hundred or seven one three four four one six five one seven. How do you determine whether I'm a candidate? That's how you do it. Give us your information. Give us permission verbally to look at your medical information. I do that for free. I'll call you, and we'll do an, uh, uh, just a telemedicine uh, visit, and I can usually tell if you're a candidate or not. Uh, can this and the surgery be done in one 10-day visit? Yeah. You, after we do this over the phone, you come see me. The surgery's the next day, and uh, you're, you're out of here, usually before 10 days. Um, how long is the wait list? It, it's not very long at all at this time of year. We don't, generally we don't do many patients the week of, of Thanksgiving or Christmas, but uh, uh, the wait list, it's usually just four, four to six weeks. Sometimes it's, it's shorter than that. During COVID, it's not been bad. What is the percent of major complications or death of this procedure out of the 2,000 done so far? Okay, uh, there have been no operative deaths with me. I've had no phrenic nerve injuries, although if you look at the series in other cities, there's an incidence of phrenic nerve injury, which is the nerve to the diaphragm, and I think that's catastrophic. Uh, being short of breath is worse than AFib, but I've never had that in 16 years. Um, we've transfused maybe 10 patients out of 2,000, 
we have used pacemakers in a handful of patients. I think it's seven patients out of 2,000, so it's very, very low. Uh, we've had a couple patients have a blood clot in their leg, which can happen after any uh, general anesthetic. We use the orthopedic surgeon's protocol to prevent uh, blood clots in the leg, uh, but it can happen. It's maybe a handful out of 2,000. We've had a few people develop pneumonia post-op. I haven't seen a pneumonia in probably five years now. We've had uh, zero deaths at, uh, at Methodist. Everybody's gone home and done well. We've had two patients that have had a post-operative stroke uh, out of 2,000, which is incredibly a low percent, but it's not zero. Uh, one of those patients had a uh, deficiency. It's called um, factor V Leiden. So they have a, a blood dyscrasia, which uh, dramatically increases their risk of stroke. Uh, so sometimes there's some really uh, other, other comorbidities that, that are present. Even so, we've only had uh, two out of 2,000. Uh, and those two were in patients that had other blood problems. Um, so I think that's most of them. We're coming up on about an hour. We usually cut it off at about an hour. But uh, uh, Ross, um, you've given your our email. And if, they, if someone uh, goes to wolfminimaze.com, I can also forward your latest one to them if they want it. Um, yes. Any, any other... Things I know we, there's no way you can get through everything. In my mind, one of the big advantages of the mini maze is that we address these little nerves on the outside of the heart instead of saying we just need to burn up the left atrium like a catheter ablation to treat it. Right. But what's what's another take-home message you might have for people that are that are on? I, I think the you know I, in thinking about this before uh, the uh, podcast, I'm, I'm, it's very important. I, I, I'm going to hold this up, see if people can see it. Yeah. This is a, a pulse, a finger pulse oximeter. Okay. Mm. Just to, you know, you can get them at the pharmacy and so forth. Very important or very, uh, yes, very important tool. When I was in paroxysmal a, uh, a, AFib, uh, it snuck up on me. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really watch those durations, how long they were lasting, how high that heart rate was, until I got backed into a persistent uh, condition. Uh, please try to watch that. If you see you you are making that transition from uh, paroxysmal to persistent, or if you're already in persistent, you're behind the power curve. Uh, be proactive. Get out there and and. Uh, Get as much information as you can. I'll be glad to share information. Most all these doctors are, are definitely welcome or are eager to share their knowledge and make a decision. That's the important thing. Get your life back. Get your quality of life back and enjoy life. It's, well, that's my message. And my message is: people with AFib want hope. A lot yes. of patients go to their family doc and says, "Number one, you got AFib. Number two, you're going to be on blood thinner the rest of your life. Learn to live with it." And number three, you're always going to have AFib. And that's not true. For a lot of patients, there is hope. You, just like Ross, you can get off blood thinners. And you can get back in rhythm, even if you've been continuously out of rhythm for a year or two. So you should have hope. And uh, hope is a big part of happiness. And then really, that's what you want at the end of the day. You want to be happy and not be burdened by some disease like this. Um, there was a, a one question, any COVID outbreak at Methodist? The answer is no. And we're doing the cases as normal here. As I said, last week, one patient flew in from uh, Palm Desert, the other from Indianapolis. Uh, no problem. We've had not, nobody who's come here has gotten COVID, knock on wood. And I found recently flying to be uh, unbelievably safe, really. So it's not slowed us down at all. And the last comment is, thank you both. Excellent. How about that, Ross? Maybe that's, that's, a, good, yes. maybe that's a good place to end. So you can go to wolfminimaze.com for more information. Uh, you can go to, uh, you can email Ross if you'd like his updated uh, matrix. 
I'd like to thank the, the crew here at uh, DeBakey CV Live for coordinating all this. They go from your laptop to mine to our faces to the questions. They really got it down. I hope you all enjoyed it. And this, uh, this presentation will be up on the website. Uh, gentlemen, what's the way for people to go get this and look at it again um, afterwards? Hmm? YouTube, YouTube and go to DeBakey CV Live. DeBakey CV Education. And you can look at this uh, anytime you want. So Ross, uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, for everyone out there, whoever your candidate is, keep your fingers crossed. Although I got a feeling we're not going to know at the end of tonight who's going to be the next president. Uh, we'll see. And hopefully this was a nice little break from the cacophony of the political campaign. Thank you all and good evening and have a nice week.